Hello, this is Bobby from Ragged Poet, and it's Lena March Day 11, I think. No, 10. And I'm going to do 11 as well. And we're going to talk about the snake and the coffin, number eight, seven, and eight cards. And the question was. What do the snake and coffin cards mean to you? And let's see another bit. What experience have I got of something cutting off my progress and how have I overcome this? How do you put an end to negative or deceptive influences? Okay, well the So what do they mean to me? So talking about the snake um, this is the Lilac and Cherry Lenormand from um, Russia. Snake's kind of quite negative. I think in Lenormand um, it's got that serpenty, nasty, sly, slithering kind of um, associations. But I actually quite like snakes. I used to have a pet snake um, back in England. Um, they, they're, they're very dangerous, they can be very dangerous, but they teach you to be wary um, and to, to respect that, like, kind of like the ocean really. Um, everything that has this huge danger has got a kind of warning element to it, and uh, that demands respect, especially in nature. And I think a snake is a bit like that. Um, you have to respect them, respect their space. So. I don't really see snakes as negative. And in traditional symbology, they're associated with wisdom. Um, and then there's the Ouroboros, which is kind of cyclical. Um, when that's the symbol, it's actually on the back of the Mary Eldick, the snake biting its own tail. Um, so that gives another element of renewal and cycles um, and self-supporting. I, I guess really. Um, I think um, Nietzsche, the German philosopher, had this theory of um, everything in nature going back to its own beginnings again, and the Ouroboros is a bit like that. Um, also, the snake sheds its own skin, um, which is pretty amazing, and that's a symbol of renewal and, and rebirth. Um, the snake's also related to the spinal cord and um, Kundalini, which is the inner inner life force. Um, it's associated with trees, um, especially in some of the tarot cards it's seen hanging from the um, sorry, Lenormand cards. And in the Garden of Eden, it's um, it, the serpent was hanging is often depicted hanging in a tree. So it's in the symbol of. Um, Mercury, uh, what's it called? Caduceus, you know, the two, there's two serpents like intertwining with each other. They're kind of like yin and yang. Um, and there's another, um, it used to be used or is used sometimes by homeopaths. Um, the snake twining around a staff, which is the rod of Asclepius. Um, and that was associated with healing um, in ancient. Rome or Greece, I'm not sure which one, ancient Greece I think, yeah. So snakes like this one here, snakes can be charmed, um, you can move them out of the way with a stick, um, so they're not all bad, they might have a bad side, they might be a bit cold blooded, but they've also got a lot of good stuff to them, so even I think Jung spoke about, he may have spoken, was it Jung who, who spoke about um, the, the snake when they use the symbol, especially in the Mercury um, Caduceus, I think it's called, yeah. It's like the yin and yang, the positive and the negative, because in homeopathy, um, which I believe Jung spoke of but never practiced because he wasn't really interested in the body, only in the mind, um, he the, you can you cure like with like. So one of the cures for um, in homeopathy, which I've actually had, is called lachesis, and it's the 
made from um, snake venom and it cures all sorts of um, allergies to insect bites and bites and it really helps the various different ailments. So the sneaky snakey is not so bad after all and what does it say on the, this is the blue owl and almond. Vile is the serpent who lulls with a bite, be not indulgent or slow to the fight. Flee every moment she turns on the charm, this poised opponent will spring to your harm. So yeah, they don't really like it much. And I know how they say she, but men could be just as sneaky snaky as females. Um, but no, I'm not going to subscribe to the snake a bad theory. They're kind of nice watery creatures too. So I like snakes. And then coffins. Is there a question with the coffin one? Um, oh yeah, it's the same question. So traditionally, they, they're they about sickness and um, fear, endings, phobias, um, but they can end bad things as well as good things. Um, my own association with coffins that I think about is, especially in a system when it's symbolizing or a metaphor for something, I mean, when you bury someone in a coffin, they're kind of buried, but they're not forgotten. You don't forget them. So when it's with the snake, it, it makes me think of maybe um, possibly underlying illness or some form of deception or obstacle um, that's actually temporarily gotten rid of, like or out of sight, out of mind, kind of out of sight, but not out of mind, I should say. Um, and it's a symbol of mortality, um, which again, like I said about the snake, being aware of our own mortality is only gonna hopefully enhance what we're doing now. Um, and death is, you know, about, it can be the death of old beliefs, um, like the snake shedding its skin. They're quite related, those two cars in some ways. But in, I don't know how many of you have read Moby Dick, you, Americans hopefully well have but now I might pronounce this wrong but Queequeg, Queequeg had a coffin and the coffin started off being um, the sign of his kind of impending doom and death and then when he changed his mind about dying it was the chest he took to see which symbolized his life carrying on for him um, and then when Pequod, the, the boat sank, um, the coffin became a float, a life-saving device, so it, it saved his life in the end. So coffins aren't totally all bad either, although I'm not particularly attracted to coffins. Um, and so what have we got for the poem? Illness is known, sickness is near, fate has its own, end into fear. You lose your money, all's hopeless to you, and what's not funny, your courage fails too. Well, I know I've read about it having an ending for um, phobias and fear. Phobias are irrational fears though. I have a phobia. Um, and they are totally, a phobia is irrational, so again, Sometimes our mind leads us to believe things that aren't quite true, and the thought is worse than the actual deed. So, there we go, snake and coffin, and oh yeah, the question, so what's cut off my progress and how have I overcome this? How do you put an end to negative or deceptive influences? Um, when I start to feel negative or feel bad energy from someone, I leave, basically. I learned this lesson a few years ago. Um, I'm not very good at putting up strong boundaries and I'm an empath, so I'm very sensitive to the energy that other people put out. Um, if I sense bad energy in a room, I just leave. Or negative negativity, I, I leave the space. And if there's someone in my life providing that kind of energy, injecting that kind of energy into my life, then I, I get the scythe and I chop them out, mate. They get weeded out um, because life's too short. There's too many good people to hang out with, and I don't need that bad shit in my life. And yeah, it's happened a few times, um, and it's not always easy to get rid of these people. But sometimes you get quite close to them, but it's got to be done. 
another thing you can actually brush away negative energy just um, use your hands and, and literally sweep it away from your body sweep it down sweep it all away that's another technique I use um, I'm thinking on the positive side of things um, but negativity is something I think you have to deal with quickly and maybe quite drastically and that's where your scythe which we're going to talk about soon may come in handy um, well, I suppose various things have cut off my progress in time but I think the biggest um, obstacle to progress in in humans is our own self-doubt and we create obstacles that actually don't really exist so you have to kind of retrain your thought systems I think so I know when I was trying to get residency here which was really hard I was expecting all the time to get this letter from um, the immigration people saying you've got to leave the country you've got to leave the country and because I expected that it actually happened um, not just once either and then I changed my thought pattern um, I'll, I'll talk about that because I think it's about the next question I think is about silver linings so I'll talk about that then because it's relevant to that but yeah changing thought patterns is a good way of dealing with the negative and things that prevent you from moving on and sometimes you do you just have to cut everything cut ties so okie dokie so that's the end of the snake and the coffin and I'm going to come back in a minute and do the bouquet and the scythe. Okay, so this is um, day 11 of Lenore March, and I'm starting, and it's about the bouquet and the scythe, so I thought I'd show you my scythe. And you can just see it down there. It's a real old Grim Reaper job. It's actually an American scythe, and it's big and very sharp. I'm a tiny little person. It's way too big for me. Um... But yeah, I thought I'd show you. I can zoom in there. There you go. It is rusty. They're quite hard to use, but you can see how lethal it looks. And you know, even if you pick it up the right way, Kelly, you can still gash your own ankles pretty badly. I assure you. Um, anyway, I thought I'd show you that little darling. Okay, so now we're back again up at the table with the bouquet and the scythe cards again from the lilac and cherry twilight and the blue owl um i forgot actually the these kelly these books this little book that came with the lilac and um cherry twilight it's got a tiny little bit about each card and i should have read you the meaning that it gives you traditionally for the um the snake and the coffin so for the lilac traditionally it says it's treachery deceit hypocrisy but for the lilac twilight the snake means dangerous acquaintances unsafe walking betrayal and deceit and in the cherry twilight closeness to an enemy anger ingratitude a stab in the back danger of death so that's still quite negative um and the coffin lost separation painful experiences it says for the traditional meanings and then in the lilac twilight big changes important events a turning point in life a time of mourning and in the cherry twilight personal loss ending of relationships grief expenses difficulties unrest which is quite similar to tradition i guess for the bouquet we've got simplicity naturalness romance freshness of feelings gifts from a pure heart for the lilac and for the cherry, formality, executive gift, bombastic communication, peaks of relations is over, a good mine at bad game, a good mine at bad game. Not quite sure what that means, but there we go. The scythe, need for resolute action to cut off an ana anachronistic ending, a long period, final effort, long awaited result, which is what it gives for the traditional re re meaning. And in the lilac twilight, this one, time to get results of previous efforts and gain on merit, which is very similar to the harvest thing. And the cherry twilight, transience of life, vain efforts, warning that time was up. Well, I guess that comes from the Grim Reaper Association. So that's out of the book. Um, but... What's my question? 
again, lost my question. Okay, what do the bouquet inside mean to you? Can painful experiences have a silver lining? Well, sure they can. But first of all, the meaning. So I guess a bouquet to me just means happiness, um, a gift. Um, apparently it's associated with a vegetarian diet. Um, I'm a vegan, so it comes close. In one of the meanings I read for the, the normal bouquet. So I think of celebrations, weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, um, ritual, because it's kind of ritualistic how people give bouquets at the same time of year, like an anniversary or something. And it can also be, in that respect, I guess, representative of renewing of um, love and vows and affirming a relationship. Um, beauty. Um, messengers, I see flowers and bouquets as messengers because of things like interflora and messages of love and things like that. Um, and of course, of course, depending on the flowers in the bouquet, there's huge symbolism in every single flower, the colours and everything. But I'm not sure if that's what this is all about, but it's there. Um, I have a problem sometimes with flowers because I actually like them growing in the garden and I get quite sad when they get cut off and they die quickly. So I would give it a meaning too of a foreshortened life. <laughs> I'm a bloody weirdo. Um, and the scythe, the beloved scythe, which I showed you earlier. So traditionally we've got the sudden shark cut or accident or shock. Um, but I agree with um, Kelly, um, it's about harvest and reaping what you sow, um, it could be a time of judgement. It's also a very lunar um, feminine symbol um, and it was actually attributed to the god Saturn um, in Roman times, he was a god of agriculture. And they used to have a festival called Saturnalia, which was a festival of harvest and sowing. Um, it was also associated, so it was held around about the beginning of December back then. Probably the seasons have changed pretty quite a lot since then because harvest now would be more like August time over there. Um, but it was also um, associated with the beginning of light again because that that's obviously just before the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. So Saturnalia was about light, but apparently it all turned into lots of drunken revelry and stuff as well and was an excuse for all kinds of debauchery. So, um, yeah. And I think the Greek version of Saturn was Kronos, who he used the scythe to castrate Uranus, his father, so he wasn't so nice. And, yeah, he used it as a weapon. Um, but, again, like the snake, the... I see the scythe as when you harvest the wheat or whatever you're chopping down, um, you're actually making way and preparing the ground for the new season as well. So it's again, it's about cycles and renewal. I would definitely give it that kind of um, symbology, especially when you use a scythe, which I have very badly and not very successfully. Um, it's a continual, you, you just swing over and over again, it's repetitive motion. Um, so I think the whip card in the Norman has a thing of repetition, but the scythe could be that. It's this cycle, you know, backwards and forwards. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of different meanings for scythes. Um, and they don't all have to be bad. But I like the fact that the scythe blade looks like a bit of a slice of the moon. And it is very feminine. I'm not sure if it's a feminine card in the Norman if, or if they have male masculine and feminine cards. I haven't studied it that much. And all my meanings are about me, they're not about traditional Lenormand or what's right and wrong. Um, so you've got to forgive me for that. So what have we got on these things? For the bouquet and the blue owl, happiness and you from the flower scent, the outlook for you means encouragement. Days will be filled with pleasures come true. Fate has so willed the best unto you. Ain't that lovely? And the scythe looms bare, danger stalks too. Of strangers beware, they can harm you. If some nearby cards hold favourable view, good are the odds you'll overcome too. 
So that's a good meeting for the side with the bouquet. Um, okay, silver linings. Where's that question ball? Can painful experiences have a silver lining? Yeah, totally. Um, most of them. I've had some very painful experiences in my time and I remember I had a miscarriage very late, about six months pregnant, in between my last two children. I was very ill. Um, and it was horrendous and horrific. But I managed somehow to turn it into a positive experience. When I lost the baby, it was in my own home. My homeopath was there, all my children were around me. And it was a very, very loving experience. And we honoured Shug. And one day we'll meet again. Um, Shug was the name of the bump. All my bumps had names. So it was a horrendously painful experience but I did manage to turn it into something positive for myself and my young children and so yeah that was one example another one which I mentioned earlier um, when I was getting very negative about my being kicked out of this country nine ten years ago um, we had a really bad car accident we rolled this huge truck four-wheel drive truck about 200 meters down a bank just me and the four kids and unbelievably no one was really hurt except me I had to clamber out among all this matagori and stuff and up the bank and I was six kilometers from cell phone reception um, I managed to get the way the truck rolled and landed it was so hard to open the door because I had to kind of it was a side opening door and I had to open it upwards uphill and I was surrounded by this matagori, which is really thorny, vicious, prickly stuff that ripped me to shreds. But I got my kids out, I got them up the bank safely, adrenaline kicked in. I left them sitting there and told them to wait and I walked six kilometres, bleeding and bruised and scratched. My heart going about 100, 200 beats to the minute until I got cell phone reception. Um, and then I managed to get help and the car was written off. Um, or even before that I noticed the engine was still running I had to rush down it was November I was worried about bushfires and go back into it and turn the engine off because there was oil leaking out everywhere the petrol tank had burst it was horrible we were very very lucky but I looked back at that incident and I just thought well we could have been hurt, we could have been maimed, all sorts of things could have happened, but it didn't. We were all safe. We had a little bit of whiplash, or my daughter did, the others were fine, I was scratched and bruised and battered, but we survived it, and I thought, right, okay, bugger you New Zealand immigration, if I can survive this, that's a message from the universe that I'm meant to be in this country, and I'm gonna fight until I get to be here. And that is what I did. And from that day, I changed all my negative thoughts about it to positive ones. And it wasn't easy going from then on, but it was much more positive. Um, and I refused to think and even consider that we might get kicked out of the country. So there we go. I've done days 10 and 11. I'm still behind, but I'm getting there. And on that little note, I shall leave you and I'll see you again for my for days 12 and 13. And I'm not even quite sure what they're about yet, but I'll no doubt find out soon. Okay, bye.